Alberto. Hello. Hello. Oh, it's so good to see yeah, you. You too. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So this is Nature's Apprentice Farm. It is, yeah. I can't wait for a tour. I call the farm Nature's Apprentice because I look to nature for inspiration. My partner grew up in, in this land, like her mom lives over there, and this used to be part of her property. And we severed six and a half acres from her land and, and bought them from her so that we could invest in the land without fear of like losing it. Because there's a lot of sweat equity that goes into this. On a mechanized farm, usually the beds are four feet wide because that's the space in between the wheels of the tractor. My beds are two and a half feet wide. In those four feet wide beds, they usually plant three rows of carrots because they have to mechanically weed in between them. So there's a lot of exposed soil. I plant in two and a half feet, I plant about six rows. If you compare the numbers of yield, which every farmer is obsessed about, right? I basically can get double the yield with this system than a mechanized farm can. I plant very densely so that one, I can grow more food in the same space. And when the plants are little like this, there is still a lot of exposed soil. But once they are like halfway developed like these lettuces, the canopy of the crop is covering the soil. So there is no soil exposed. So we reduce evaporation of water. We also make the habitat for weeds worse. So the crop is actually keeping the weeds down. I try to create an environment where the weeds don't thrive. So the soil is always covered at all times. So that's why we have wood chips in the pathways. Also, we do not till the soil. Tilling creates sort of a perfect environment for the weeds to germinate because they get the disturbance. The weed seeds that are deep down in the soil get on the surface and then they get access to light and they germinate. I never till the soil and I always put at the beginning of the season a layer of compost on the bed and that gives organic matter to the soil and some biology but that also keeps weed seeds buried. And that way we have very, very few weeds to deal with. The thing I'm most proud of in the veggie garden is that we have three hedgerows. The hedgerows, the, the main idea is to create habitat to bring in life into the farm, which is one of my main goals. And if you get close to the anis hyssop there, you'll see lots of bumblebees and little flies and all kinds of things. Uh, so yeah, it's basically creating habitat for whatever wants to come in. So that's why we have also the we have bee, bee houses and bird houses. Uh, so we had a pair of uh, house wrens nesting in there. There were tree swallows back there, a bluebird over there. It creates a beautiful office for me as well. That was not an intentional at the beginning, but it has been one of the biggest benefits. I sort of follow the principles of regenerative agriculture. I increase diversity as much as possible. So I do interplanting. So you see, for example, there the beets growing with green onions. We try to do reciprocity, adding compost to the soil to me is, a, is an act of reciprocity. Creating habitat for the living beings that share the land with us is an act of reciprocity. We also work with our natural context. So for example, we've planted a lot of perennials that grow here naturally. I don't know if you can see, but all around the market garden, there are grapes. And grapes are something that grow wild here. We also have a lot of wild raspberries, so that's why we planted raspberries. We also treat the people that come here to volunteer like family and give them uh, basically free choice of veggies. So people are also part of the equation. We are also actively fundraising to donate our produce to the local food bank. We do a lot of things to save water. So we collect rainwater from every roof in the farm and we use that water primarily. And then if we need it, we have a well. We create and maintain habitat for wildlife. So three of the acres that we are stewarding are forest and we are not touching that. That is entirely for wildlife and we're basically letting natural succession to do its, its job. Something interesting to mention is that all these sunflowers that you see here were planted by chipmunks. The chipmunks cache a lot of them in their wood chips. So that's why there's tons of uh, sunflowers all around. This is Yupik strawberries. I've learned this year that it's not a, a good location for the strawberries because the weed pressure is insane from the, basically from the property line there. There's a lot of like, plants, some native, some are not, uh, that sort of are trying to encroach into this area. I don't have time to maintain this. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll plant 
shrubs that are taller and that they can compete with the weeds so I don't have to worry about it and then when the shrubs are fruiting we can pick the fruits without worrying about them molding in, in the weeds which is what was happening with the strawberries. I was thinking about a way of growing strawberries where they can get enough sunlight, enough air circulation and uh, they're easier to pick and sort of out of the reach of weeds. So I'm going to try to grow them in straw bales. So what I'm doing now is conditioning the straw so that it starts to decompose so that by the time the strawberries are established the straw bale is basically providing them with nutrients. So we're basically turning the straw bales into compost slowly. This is a little bit of buckwheat that I planted for sort of domestic consumption. I plant buckwheat as a cover crop as well because it grows really fast, it's really good for the soil. Cover crops are plants that you plant for the main purpose of improving the soil. Our soil is very sandy so it needs all the organic matter that we can give it. So that's the main purpose that I use cover crops for. So this is an agroforestry area. And agroforestry is basically a combination of perennial plants, in this case is fruit trees and, and berries, with either pasture or annual crops. So when you combine perennials with pasture, it's called silbo pasture. And when you combine perennials with crops, it's called alley cropping. The beautiful thing about this is that you increase diversity in the sort of the agro ecosystem. You have two different types of crops. Also, the perennials are providing habitat for creatures. So you see lots of butterflies around. There's also wildflowers interplanted with the perennials. That's, for example, even in primrose and behind it is comfrey. There's a lot of uh, blue bearbane back there. There is wild bergamot, the purplish flower back there. So again, it's to, not only to create habitat, but a habitat that also feeds us. And we never plant the same fruit species right next to the same species so that if there is a pest that attacks that tree it has to travel a long ways to find the next one so it has a higher chance to be eaten by a beneficial uh, creature. Back there I planted this spring uh, three northern pecans and three heart nuts. These small shrubs here are hazelnuts and this is the electric fence that basically keeps the deer out of all the growing space and then all the trees that we have here are protected. You see those tall very green plants in the background there those are sunchokes which I used to have in the hedgerows but they spread like crazy especially when they have a sandy fertile soil they grow like nuts. So I move them over there where there's no risk of them encroaching anything that I maintain actively but that is also a food storage that is amazing there. They are never going to fail because they grow like weeds and that's another way of working with our context. So even in the middle of winter we can we could dig in there and and find tubers to eat you know. They call it an apocalypse food. Yeah exactly. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. it's going to be there regardless of what else is. Yeah yeah. This used to be a wet forest and when they cut the trees and bulldoze the topsoil they had to drain the field because otherwise it was too wet to grow crops. We have been trying to return some of that wetland or restore some of that wetland to restore the habitat for the creatures that depend on that wetland. So this was one of the areas where the water was pooling in the spring after while the ground was frozen uh, but the snow was melting. The water was stopping here. so. We got this pond dug in November 2020. In March of 2021, we had toads already singing here. This makes me really happy because when you give life a chance, it takes it right away. It's super reassuring that when you create habitat, life takes over immediately. And I'll show you even a more stark example of this year. This is the new wetland. It's almost a quarter of an acre, so almost as big as the veggie garden. And in five days, it was full of water. And the day after, there were great tree frogs singing in here. So again, 
you give life a chance and it just takes it and, and runs with it. The Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority came and planted a bunch of uh, native shrubs and small trees all around the wetland. Hopefully in a few years this will all be vegetated, it will be full of warblers and, and all kinds of life. As I told you, I only see things to be done when I look here, right? So I also put energy into making the farm beautiful as a reminder that this is an amazing place to live in, not only a place to work. Even when I was working in academia, I always wanted to live in a rural area where I could grow food. I always have trouble comparing my income to the average Canadian income. My income is plenty if you consider that I have a very simple life and I don't need a lot to live and I generate a lot of what I need. Even though my salary is below the poverty line, I am super happy. I have a very fulfilling life. This is incredibly rewarding work, even though it's really hard most of the time. I'm sure you also enjoy a level of food security that few others would compare to. Yeah, especially now that we have the root cellar, we can eat a lot of things year round from our garden. I don't remember the last time I bought veggies at the store. We don't need to buy eggs. We could survive from the food that the ecosystem produces.